Good evening. I'd like to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining with us for our online Bible study. And uh, tonight we are going to continue in our study and series on the names of God. So let's pray and commit this time to the Lord. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we're thankful tonight that we can be found together in the study of your word once again. And Father, as we study more about your names and as we uh, discover more truths about you, Father, I pray that it would indeed be a, a help and a blessing to us. Father, not just to uh, know thee intellectually, but Father, that we might know thee experientially. We pray, Lord, that we might uh, know thee and uh, in our knowledge of the Holy Lord, that so our walk with you would be so much the more increased and enriched. So do bless us, we pray, and we'll thank you in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. We've um, seen over the past several weeks as to how God, in a, a few different ways, has revealed himself and revealed his name uh, through his works. Oftentimes, he has uh, revealed himself uh, to, his, uh, to, to man, to his creation, uh, in a way that would best suit their pressing need at that time. So we've seen that uh, God has revealed himself to us as Elohim. And we saw that he's eternal, he's the creator. We also saw that it speaks of himself as being a triune God and a faithful God. Then we saw the God's personal name, which is the name Jehovah. And that's the, uh, where you see it capitalized L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. Then you know that it's speaking about Jehovah. Last week we saw uh, El Shaddai, and that's the, the mighty God. And tonight we want to consider the name Adonai. And we'll find it uh, in our Bibles translated as Lord. But in this case, there's a capital L and O-R-D are in the lower case. So where you come across this word Lord, um, it is the Hebrew word Adonai and it means master. So before we've seen the, with the various names of God, up until now uh, our premise has been that God has revealed himself, uh, introducing himself um, to his creature under a different name and at a different time. But in this particular case, um, Adonai had already existed. It was a common or generic name that was used of other men. Uh, but now there's a slight difference in that you'll find this word uh, all in the lowercase, uh, L-O-R-D, and uh, the Hebrew is uh, Adon. And so that has to do with, uh, with other men who are in positions of authority. Um, they may be mentioned as being Lord, uh, but it's, it's a slightly different a way of the spelling it in the, the Hebrew, where it is Adon as a instead of Adonai, and of course the the in our English we see it all in the lower case. Uh, again, it spoke of leadership. It spoke of authority over another person. So, although God uses a name here that is commonly known by uh, by, by mankind. Here we, we see it in the context that God is revealing himself to us as our master and he's revealing himself to us as the one who is our all in all. So when you think in terms of master, you think in terms of a master and slave relationship. So in our own country, uh, thankfully for uh, a little over 200 years, this practice of slavery has been abolished. But when you think of slavery, you think of a few different things. Possibly one of the things we, we don't take note of is that is that in some African countries, their particular tribal leaders who were African themselves were complicit in the slave trade. They would uh, capture people, uh, possibly of different tribes, and they would sell them on to the European slave traders. So when you think of slavery, you think of, well, where it originated in Africa, and you think of, you know, poor innocent people being captured by their own 
uh, nationality and been sold on. You think of the uh, terrible trips that they would be taken on those slave boats uh, under cruel uh, and terrible conditions. You wouldn't want to transport animals in such a, a terrible uh, condition. You also think about the hard labour that they would endure, the beating, cruel treatment, that they would be viewed as uh, little more than a piece of property. So when you think of slavery, it certainly has, it is a blight on our own history uh, as a country. And although slavery is abolished, sadly it does still exist in some terrible and wicked forms to this day. But of course it is illegal. But in the ancient world, slavery was quite different to how we would view slavery in more recent times. Now I don't say this excuse slavery, I'm just trying to put a, a perspective before you so that you can understand as to how slavery was viewed in biblical times as opposed to how we might think of it in our more recent history. So slavery did include ownership, but it was different to the ownership of, say, an animal. A purchased slave would enjoy a closer relationship with his master than what perhaps somebody that was hired to do a particular task on the farm. He was considered to be a, a part of the family of his master. Uh, he, was an, he was owned, and, and, and of course there's no nice way of saying that, he was owned, but he, and he was considered to be the property, but he enjoyed a very close relationship uh, as a slave. And as a purchased slave, he had the right to the master's protection. As a purchased slave, he also had the right to the master's provision. It's also interesting that with Abraham and Sarah, before they, they had a, their son, Isaac, the heir of Abraham's entire household was actually a, a servant, a slave. If you'd like to go to Genesis chapter 15 with me, Genesis chapter 15, and we'll read the first few verses there. Verse 1 says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? So up until this time he had no children at all. Uh, Ishmael hadn't been born, you only see of that in the next chapter, and of course there was no Isaac. He said, Lord, what will thou give me, uh, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Elysia of Damascus. So Elysia was the, uh, the head slave, but he viewed Elysia as the, the one that was the heir of his whole household. Because verse 3 says, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. He's referring to Elysia. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thy heir, heir, uh, heir but he shall come forth out of uh, thy own bowels, shall be thy heir. So Elysia was heir of all that Abraham owned, all that Abraham possessed, but Elysia was Abraham's slave. So the slave-master relationship was far closer in a far closer relationship in biblical times than what it was in more recent times. Now the Bible teaches us that God is our Lord, He's our Jehovah, and so He's our Elohim, He's our Jehovah. We've seen that He's our Almighty God, He is our um, El Shaddai, but He's also our Master. And so when we think of our God as being our master, we don't think of a, a master from which we would um, shrink away from in fear and in terror and in, uh, in fear of any kind of mistreatment. No, we think of our master uh, in a different light altogether. We can draw near to our master and he's our Adonai and he's one that provides for us and he's one that's able to protect us and meet our every need. So we see this uh, emphasized actually and we'll see how it's emphasized throughout the Old Testament in Psalms 23 for instance, 123 I beg your pardon, um, David says this, he says in, in Psalms 123 verse 1 and 2, 
and to thee lift up my eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Then notice the principle, verse 2. He says, Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of a mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that we have mercy upon him, until he have mercy upon us. So in this particular scripture, now the, we see that God has been emphasized as being he, our Jehovah. He's the Lord. He's Jehovah, our God, Elohim. And, and David is saying that this Jehovah, this Elohim, the one who is our God, he's going to meet our needs in the same way that a master would meet the needs of his servant. So he says, just like a, a child would look to his father for his needs to be met, just like a servant would look to his master and a, a maid to a mistress, so our Elohim, our Jehovah, is our master and he's going to provide for our all. So when we think of him, we don't shrink away from him, we rather look to him as our master, one that's going to meet our every need. So a few examples for us, uh, firstly with Moses. When Moses was commissioned by God to deliver Israel from Egypt, Moses addressed God as Adonai, and he addressed him as master. He was acknowledging that God had a, a right to his life, a, a right to his service, and Moses acknowledged this master-servant relationship. He knew God as master. So in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10, this is what God says. Exodus chapter 4 verse 10, Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, uh, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So notice he says, Moses said unto the Lord, Jehovah, O my Adonai, Jehovah my Adonai, Lord my Lord. He is saying, I'm not able. And so send someone else and prove that you're my all in all here. Meet this need that I have. And of course we know as to how God would assure Moses in this particular situation and uh, even though Moses would need really no help, God provided um, help for him and, and he was uh, helped by his brother Aaron and Aaron became his mouthpiece. But no doubt God had provided for his need and was his sufficiency at this particular time. So Moses was appealing to his master, to his Adonai for help. And then another example in the Old Testament would be Gideon. So Gideon was called of God to deliver the children of Israel from the Midianites. And in Judges chapter 6, Gideon asked God and says unto him, in chapter 6 verse 15, he said unto him, O my Lord, O my Adonai, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, I am the least in my father's house. So notice he is addressing God as his master, Adonai. And God replies in verse 16, and he notices it says, and the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, so, and Jehovah replies. So Gideon is addressing God as his master, Adonai. Jehovah replies and says unto him, surely I'll be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. So he's looking to his Adonai, his master, to provide. He's saying, I'm not able, I'm just of the, the poorest and the least of the tribes. And then David also is a, a, another example. David, of course, had a very humble origin. He was just a shepherd boy. And God had sent Samuel to anoint him to be the next king over Israel in the stead of Saul. And now he had, come, he had become a king. And God had intended to establish the throne of David forever. And this is, we know this has been the Davidic covenant. And when God in in 2 Samuel chapter 7 rehearses to David all that he's going to do for his uh, name and for his family. 
And as God is impressing the, the details of the Davidic covenant with David, David is surely astounded that God is going to um, use him and think of him in such a way. And so if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we'll read from verse 18. And I like you to notice that uh, verse 18 says that uh, King David, then went King David in and sat before the Lord, sat before Jehovah, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. Do you notice how many times he is referring to his God as Master, Lord God? And in fact, when you read through the Psalms, you'll find that this is a, a very well-used name that David uses of God. He often refers to him as Adonai. So in Psalms 141, in verses 8 through to 10, David says, My eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord, Adonai. In thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. He says, keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and for the jinns. Oh, jinns is like a, a snare or a trap. The jinns of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst I withal escape. So he's looking to, to Adonai specifically, his master, to provide and to protect him from his enemies. So when you think of a master in a biblical sense, uh, those masters in the Bible were, were good men and were a blessing to those that were in the household, including the, the servants. And of course, when you think about our God as being our master, then of course it's a wonderful thought that he is someone that's going to provide and protect us. Uh, another example is with Isaiah. In Isaiah, we read that King Uzziah had died, and it was here that, uh, or then, that Isaiah received his vision uh, of God's throne room. And in Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. He saw Adonai sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So King Uzziah, you could say that Isaiah's earthly lord and master had died, but his heavenly master lived on and reigned supreme. And uh, you see as to how in this commission, it is a commission that Adonai gives to, um, to Isaiah. In verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord, Master, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I send me. So throughout the Old Testament we find that God is addressed as Adonai and those were his, who were his servants readily and willingly uh, reflected on the fact that God was their master and they were his servants. And they often would refer to him and call upon him uh, to, to, as an appeal for help and they believed and knew that he was going to provide and help them like no one else ever could. So that's how they approached Adonai in the Old Testament, uh, their master in the Old Testament. Now as we come to the New Testament, the meaning of Adonai is carried over and it obviously applies to our, our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Now the word is slightly different and it is the Greek word kurios. And we find this word some 650 times, but it still emphasizes the same truth as what we would consider when we think of Adonai. So we could say that Jesus is our Adonai, uh, if you were to use the Hebrew terminology in the Greek, it is the Kyrios, he is our Kyrios, and he is of course our master. 
Now here's an interesting fact when you think about Jesus as being our master. You know, when you read through the book of, of Acts, for instance, it is very interesting that you see that Jesus is only referred to as Savior some two times. Twice, Jesus is referred to as Savior, and around about a hundred times, he's referred to as being Lord. So that's quite a, an interesting fact there. Now, there are some, in some circles, uh, the, the belief that uh, in order to be saved, you have to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And sometimes we use this terminology, but there, there, are, there is a specific group of people that would think, that think in terms of Lordship salvation. And so they would insist that if, if Jesus Christ is not your Lord, if you don't make him Lord over your life, then he's not going to be, he can't be your saviour. So Lordship salvation, if you wouldn't, was to boil it down to that, that you've got to say that he is my master in order to be saved, well then we would disagree with it quite strongly. It is a work-based uh, religion then. If Lordship salvation demands that Christ is made Lord over all your life before you can be saved, well that presents two big problems. It presents an impossible situation because how can a person that is dead in sins make Christ Lord over their life? And of course it also presents a heretical situation because it is adding something to the salvation that is free that we have in Christ. So. I think that Lordship Salvation probably came about as a counter to what was known as easy believism, where it was just a matter of if you just believe that Jesus died upon the cross and just you know trust him as your saviour. But in the, the believism, and of course to believe in Christ is an easy thing, so maybe it's a misnomer to say that, but um, it was to counter this uh, empty belief, if you like, you know, that you're just going to... Um, mentally acknowledge certain truths about the gospel uh, and think that that is salvation. And so uh, in Matthew chapter 7, for instance, that makes it quite clear because uh, Jesus says, many will come into me in that day saying, Lord, Lord. And so they, they will have uh, had some sort of a belief, but, you know, you know, and they would have done many great different works, Jesus even says there, but he says, I never knew you. And so... I think to counter this easy believism, lordship salvation came to the fore. But I, I always endeavour to be, uh, you know, man-made terms don't really matter that much. I think it's important to be a student of the word of God and we want to be a biblicist. And so for, when it comes to matters of salvation uh, and theology, I would say quite clearly that I'm not a Calvinist at all. Um, but I do believe that salvation is all of God. I don't think that we aid uh, to the salvation in one way at all. We would say salvation is all of God. But then on the other hand, we would also have to affirm that this wonderful salvation that God has provided requires a response from, um, from man. So to add to what Christ has done or to take away from what Christ has done is to, of course, um, to take away and to add to the gospel. And of course, that is a, then a different gospel altogether. So when we come to salvation, we would say salvation was in the heart of God from eternity past. It was progressively real, revealed to man uh, throughout the, the word of God and it reached its uh, climax in the Lord Jesus Christ where he fulfilled all the promises and all the pictures that we have in the Old Testament when he died upon the cross and made the way possible that sinful men and women could be saved. And of course now today God uses his Holy Spirit who uses his word to bring men and women to a realisation of their con lost condition and their, their need of the Saviour. Now, you may be wondering where am I going with this, but I'm saying this because I do not believe that in Lordship salvation in the sense that you have to make him Lord of your life in order to be saved. I don't think that is 
correct. So I do not believe in that at all. But I do believe that when a, a sinner comes to the realization of their sinfulness and they recognize who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for them to provide a salvation, that same sinner then has no problem in confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, for instance, when Peter on the day of Pentecost was preaching, he said this in, in Acts chapter 2. He said, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, curios, master, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and we know it's referring to Jesus, of course, but he uses the word Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he continues in the same chapter, in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, he says, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Later in the book of, uh, in, in the book of Acts, we find in chapter 16, where the, Philipp, the Philippian jailer, he, 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 because of the earthquake in the prison, and Paul and Silas are there, and he, he cries out to them and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul replies, and they reply, they say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. In the book of Romans, Paul promised, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So I'm saying this because when we think of Jesus as Lord, there are some people that would say, well, you don't need to confess him as Lord in order to be saved. And they are thinking in terms of lordship salvation. But I don't think we should ever, when we try and correct wrong teaching, disregard the clear teaching of the word of God. Because if Jesus, if Jesus, uh, if we think of Jesus Christ, he's not just our saviour, he's also our master, he is our Lord. He is, of course, the one that we read of in, in Genesis chapter 1 that created this world. Hebrews tells us very clear that without him was not anything made that was made. We know that he is Jehovah and he know, we know that he is God Almighty and we see him in the New Testament as our Lord, as our, our Master. Now this is a real blessing for us because if you think about it, what a, a blessing to be able to say that Jesus Christ is my Master. And of course when we think of this, we, we, ta we put aside all the, the worldly thoughts of slave and master relationships and we think about the relationship that we have with our Saviour, the one that has done more for us than we could ever hope to do for him, the one that purchased us with his own precious blood, the one that saved us. And so it's a wonderful relationship that we've entered into. And so Jesus is our Lord. And this is a phrase that is repeatedly made known to us throughout the New Testament. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. No wonder the Bible says when you think as to how salvation is all of God and how that's, uh, it's the Holy Spirit of God that brings us to a realization of our sin and our need of the Savior. And when a person truly is saved, it's no wonder that the Bible says that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So we have this privilege and this blessing of being able to consider Christ as our Saviour and recognising that he is Lord. And as we close, I want to just ask you this question. When you think of Jesus as Lord, is he Lord, is he Master over all of your life? Is he Lord in your worship? You know, when we think of Sunday, Sunday is the Lord's Day. And I know at this present time we aren't able to meet um, as freely and as frequently as we are accustomed to. And I know that some people are advised to not come and worship in person and rather stay online. But whether you're staying at home and watching online or whether you're coming in person, is Jesus Lord in your worship? 
I would say this, that if you're staying at home and you've got a young family, when it's church time, gather your family around you and lead them in worship because this is the Lord's day. And he's our master. Jesus is Lord. And so lead your family in worship. And if you're able to come into the house of God, do so recognizing that he's your master and you're his servant. And this is the Lord's day and you're coming together to worship him. And so we should consider, is he Lord in the way that I worship? Is he Lord in my service? Do I do, I do what I can for him? So often we will labor and labor hard in many different areas of our life. But what do we do for our Savior? Is he Lord in the way that I serve? Is he Lord in the gifts that we have? God has given us many different gifts. And so we, are we using those gifts for his glory? Is he Lord even over our money? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 that no man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He says you cannot serve God and mammon. So we should ask ourselves, is he Lord over my money as well? So when you think about these things, we need to... This is a question that we only ourselves personally can answer, where we would say, is he truly Lord of my life? God has blessed us and he's enriched our lives in many different ways and he's made us stewards of these things. But these things are to be used for his glory and we can be blessed as that they're also used for our good as well. So I trust that the Lord will bless you as you think about this wonderful name of our God, Adonai, in the Old Testament, Kyrios, in the New Testament, where we recognize that he's our master and we are his servants. And as our master, we look to him for our provision and we look to him for our protection. And as his servants, we want to give back to him faithfully, serving him faithfully, because we are his servants. So may the Lord bless these thoughts to your heart. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we're thankful that we can consider you and consider your different names, and particularly tonight, to consider you as our master, as our Adonai. Lord, I pray that uh, we would not just understand this with our minds, but Father, with our hearts, that we would recognize that you're our master and we can trust in you for our provision, for our protection, and as your servants, Father, that we would seek to do and give our all for your honor and for your glory. So Father, help us, we pray, to apply these truths to our hearts and to our lives. And we'll thank and praise you in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. And I look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. God bless you. Goodbye.